Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 27 of Could It Be Podcast. So it's been a little while since I've provided an update on myself, um, as we've been sharing the stories of other women recently. Um, So I thought I'd jump on and record an episode because there's been quite a bit happening in the last few months. And I just want to share the, the experience and the journey because I want people to know that it's not always a linear, everything's rosy straight away after having the surgery. So a bit of an update on a few things. So at the time of recording this, it is Monday the 15th of May. I had my final follow-up appointment with my surgeon this morning. So I think I had one in the first week or so and then a few months sort of in between so this is the final one that I will need for my explant surgery as it always is with my surgeon it was a very quick appointment Um, but I had contacted her in the lead up to the appointment to get some information to pass on to Professor Deva for the study that's being completed here in Australia so just a reminder if you have or are explanting in Australia to join the study Um, with Professor Deva. I'll include the link in the show notes to that study. But uh, Robin, um, who is working on the project as well, got in contact with me just asking for some more information on my explant, so whether I'd had a total partial or en blanc capsulectomy. And I thought that might be a good opportunity to also ask for the labs because I never actually saw them myself. So you may remember from previous episodes, the first follow-up appointment I think it was after my surgery when I went to see my specialist she seemed a bit frazzled and she had told me when I was still in hospital that my capsule had a lot of calcification through it she saw me at my first follow-up appointment and then when I went out to pay for my appointment and book the next one she was at the desk following up on whether the labs had come back yet and she was really relieved and she's like look they've come back there's no cancer in the capsule So that was the risk of that breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which you may see listed as B-I-A-A-L-C-L in some places. And um, as I have mentioned before, the implants that I had were some that were known to cause that form of uh, cancer or lymphoma. But that is all that I saw when it came to my breast implant type. When I got to the surgeon's rooms this morning, um, she asked me how I'm feeling. She had a look and she was really happy with how I'm looking. Seemed really happy to hear about the fact that I was feeling a lot better than I had been before my surgery. And she handed me the pathology report from my explant. Now, I put that straight into my handbag, came home because I needed to work for the rest of the day. And then around lunchtime, I was like, oh, yeah, I've got that report. I'll just... I was meant to take a photo of it to send it through to Professor Davis' rooms, but I haven't done it yet because I was a bit surprised by what was on that report. So I've got it in front of me now. I'm just going to read a little bit of it because I'm just blown away. So in the conclusion, so one and two is referring to left and right. Uh, So left and right breast capsules, hypocellular hyalinized capsules, showing focal calcifications and features consistent with silicon bleed. Now, I wasn't told this at all. And yeah, just a little bit blown away by that. I'm still processing that information, but thought I would share that. Um, If you have had any kind of silicon bleed with your explant and, you know, there's anything special that you've done post-surgery, please reach out because I'm just... Not quite sure what to do with that information yet. So yeah, that was one big update from this morning. This update won't necessarily be in chronological order, but just giving you a bit of a rundown on what's happened the last few months. So when it comes to migraines, I didn't really put two and two together that my implants might have been causing the migraines that I'd started to have, I'd probably say in my early 20s. And I don't get them that often. It might be one or two a year, but I generally can't see with them. They're, I think my GP referred to them as ocular migraines, and they were the reason why I couldn't go on the contraceptive pill in the past, and I had the Marina IUD. Now, the whole time I had the IUD and I did not get a migraine at all. And I finally got my first migraine since the Marina came out. I was hoping that maybe because they only started when I had implants, 
that maybe I won't get them again but uh, it was the night of the concert that we did as a band in Adelaide before we went to Austin and I was on a part of the stage where there were lights shining right in my face and I did have one rosé because like being someone that was performing at that gig that night I got one free drink so I was like a little bit nervous I thought I might just have one rosé while we were setting up um, so it might have been a combination of the two and because I didn't get on top of I didn't quite understand what was happening because the lighting in that gig venue was sort of romantic and moody lighting it was really nice but I wasn't sure whether the, my eyes were just feeling a little bit off because of the lighting and then it hit me that I couldn't focus on people's faces and that the migraine was hitting so I didn't get paracetamol in quick enough and it sort of sat with me for the next day so I finally took some Panadol when I got home went to bed pretty quickly after that but the next day I still felt a little bit off um, but I haven't had another one since that that's a couple of months ago now but my first one um, so I'm hoping maybe because I'm still recovering and like learning that information about the silicon bleed into my capsules I'm assuming that might mean that my recovery is a little bit longer because I've possibly got that in my system still and a, another bit of information I'll share like later on in the episode also falls into possibly why it's taking me longer longer to recover but anyway hopefully you know in a little bit of time I won't get those migraines but uh, yeah I just have to be wary and make sure I've got some painkillers with me just in case they hit because driving home that night was not not fun whatsoever so I've possibly shared this information previously but I want to kind of all wrap it up together because it all ties in together as well but back in September last year so this is three months after my explant I had a full panel blood test done with my previous GP she's since left the practice because she was a registrar so she was only there for six months before moving on to the next part of her career but she was really great and she did the full panel of my blood tests, including my thyroid, because I had started to gain weight after the surgery. And at the time, she sort of told me, look, your thyroid levels are high. She didn't say specifically what it was, but it's fairly high, but not enough for us to think anything's wrong at the moment. So wait a year and see if it gets worse. After that, I did ask her to have my hormone levels tested. And unfortunately, she could only, I don't quite know how to word it because it wasn't like she refused to. I don't know whether it's that she didn't know because I know endocrinology is, it's like complex. There's, there's systems that, and, and hormones that are linked with each other that, you know, if you're a GP and needing to know a little bit about everything, it's really hard to keep up with it all and like I'm really starting to feel sorry for general practitioners here in Australia I feel like they're only given maybe 10 minutes as a standard appointment time with patients and there's so much that you need to cover generally in that amount of time if you run over if you run late then that impacts the rest of your day so we're not I don't really feel like I was getting the right care but I guess that's not necessarily their fault it's the framework that it's set up on I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure but anyway she she had seen that I'd had blood tests for polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS in the past and that came back that I didn't have it and she basically said that's the only one that she could really refer me on to so I said look I'll do it like I just I feel like something's not 100% after my surgery things and also the marina you know things aren't perfect so she sent me the referral I had to wait for a specific time in my cycle to have that blood test done so by the time I went to get my results that GP had left the practice which I was really sad about because she was excellent and I had an appointment with a different GP I've only seen her once and that was because um, my normal GP that I was seeing had also, another one had also left but she'd actually gone back overseas because she'd come to Australia to do some of her training and she went back home so yeah saw this different GP 
she let me know that all of my sort of hormone levels have come back within the right ranges and she asked me why I had that particular testing done and I, I let her know look I've had my thyroid checked and that came back within the required ranges I am still gaining weight and struggling to lose it and there's things that I've done in the past healthily that have worked but they're not working anymore and there haven't been any other significant changes in my body um, apart from having the explant having the marina taken out so there's something that's possibly gone on hormone or, or thyroid wise or even cortisol like stress hormones like this there's, there's got to be something wrong anyway she asked me a few questions like whether I'd seen a dietitian an exercise physiologist which I had seen before to get the, the dietitian was partially for weight loss, also to look at endometriosis, and that's where we found out that I had the gut health issues and, and IBS. And I've seen an exercise physiologist who gave me really great like workout routine and different styles of working out and that kind of thing, and I've, I've used that. Um, I've done the CrossFit before. I do my home workouts. So I do a really good mix these days, and it just things aren't budging. And she asked some family history, like whether I've got family who are overweight and I mentioned that yes you know there are some people in my family that would be considered overweight and she basically then just said oh well it's just genetic that you're going to be overweight now I've been like I'm never going to be a skinny person I'm somebody who gains muscle quite easily and like when I've been at my smallest I would have been an Australian size 14 which would still be considered overweight Side note, years ago I had a different GP, a male GP, tell me that according to the BMI I needed to weigh between 49 and 63 kilos based on my height. So I'm not very tall, I'm about 5 foot 3. And yeah, I sort of said to him, look, the only time I've ever been anywhere near that was I got down to 68 kilos after I had my very first ovarian cyst removed. So I'd had this massive 7.6 kilo ovarian cyst which was impacting how full I felt so I wasn't eating much before the surgery so I had lost a little bit of weight just naturally by not eating as much. Had the surgery where I lost the 7.6 kilo cyst but also while I was in hospital because of everything moving back to where it was meant to be I, I just eating made me feel so ill like I wanted to throw up anytime I ate and that was just purely physical it was just the fact that like if I had a drink of water, I could feel this like gurgling moving down because my insides were moving back because they were just pushed all around my inside of my torso by that cyst. It was just moving everything when it was growing. So I walked out of hospital about 12 kilos lighter, but I hadn't been eating. I obviously couldn't exercise and I couldn't exercise for six weeks after that surgery. It was such a massive operation. So would have lost muscle mass as well. And I was 68 kilos and I look back at photos of myself then and I look ill. So I'm never going to really sit around that way. And I'm fine with that. I, I was really comfortable at the size 14 that I was years ago. And I look back at those photos and I look healthy and I felt healthy. It wasn't about being skinny or meeting a certain body type or anything. It was just what worked well for me. And yeah, I did look very health, healthy back then. So I know I can get there, but obviously something's not right, which is stopping me. So this GP then started talking to me and she started the sentence with, oh, look, there is this medication. And I'm not sure whether it's available overseas, but here in Australia, there's this medication that you can take and it can aid weight loss and it's called duramine and it's basically some people will liken it to speed I don't know I've never taken like drugs <laughs> but when I have taken duramine in the past it just switches off my hunger receptor so and also makes you feel like you, you've just got so much energy so you're just moving around a lot like my house ended up spotless the first time I took it because I just couldn't sit still but it also then caused some really horrible dry mouth. And I used to work in a call center, so that just was not okay for that situation. And it causes heart palpitations and it almost makes me 
anxious and really angry. So it just doesn't suit me. So I, I, I started to go, or oh, do you mean Duramind? Because I will never touch that again. And she's like, no, it's actually a diabetes medication. And I think I, had, I tried looking it up and I think it's called a Zempic. And she's like, oh, it's in short supply. So this is going back to February as well, by the way. She was saying that it's in such short supply in February that it wasn't going to be available until June. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. You're offering me a medication that's for type 2 diabetes sufferers purely for me to lose weight when the people who actually have the illness can't access that medication? No way. I'm not taking that away from somebody else. And I'm also not going to take that uh, like easy way out, I guess, like because I don't have something specific to that medication that requires me to take that i'm not i'm not going to take that just to lose weight it just it just seems so archaic to me that she would offer that i was just really really unimpressed and sort of promised myself i would never speak to that particular gp again anyway i've since found out that she's left that practice uh, so i don't have to worry about running into her again but i was just blown away by that so along with the weight gain, I was noticing that some of my BII symptoms were kind of coming back and it was joint pain, but this time it was actually mostly through my feet and my ankles. So again, in the morning, this was what it was like before I had my explant. I'd get up and I'd be hobbling because I was in so much pain through my feet and ankles. I had some digestion issues. So my IBS has never cleared up after explant, so that's possibly just, that is just something that I will live with, and that's fine. I know how to manage that with food now. I've also had the previous surgeries where my ovary had attached to the outside of my bowel, and I'm guessing that would make that area a bit more sensitive, so I've accepted the fact that I'm going to live with IBS, and that's totally fine. But I was having these... Like I was, I was getting a lot of heartburn, so my partner and I were doing the night walk, so we'd have dinner and then wait a little bit, and it was a decent amount of time, like an hour, hour and a half some nights before we'd go walking, and I'd get heartburn. I've never really suffered with heartburn until maybe the last 12 months or so, so that was really uncomfortable. But then also, whenever I was eating, it was like things weren't going down properly, so I would feel full very quickly, and food just wasn't enjoyable because of that. So... Just starting to feel really sluggish and really bloated and, you know, sometimes they'll list it when it comes to IBS, but like, you know, gut health issues as well, that your your brain fog can, can kind of happen. And, and I was probably having some brain fog, but I'm just so used to living with that for so long now. It was just hard to recognize that that was a real problem. So... After chatting with Lauren, who um, I've done an episode with before she had her explant, she mentioned to me that she has seen an integrative GP. And here in South Australia, we don't have that many of them. There are two main practices. They're not my side of town, but I was happy to travel. They do charge a lot more than a normal GP does, but your first appointment with them does go for an hour. So I thought I would try and get into one. But the wait, because we don't have many practices here, was huge. I think I uh, did an online form for them to contact me because I did call a practice, the closer one out of the two, to see whether I could make an appointment. She's like, look, you've just got to do an online form at the moment. We'll call you when we've got an opening. So I was like, cool, no problems. I'll do that. That was in February and they've only called me, I think it was last week, so early May. But in the meantime, I had a friend mention going to a naturopath and you know, there's such a stereotype about that kind of practitioner that I was like, oh, like, is this going to be like, you know, am I going to have to go vegan and gluten free and dairy free and take all these really extreme steps to, to feeling better? But, um, you know, I was willing to give anything a go because of how I felt. Anyway, think into this as well. Um, another part of the study with Professor Daver, I did ask my GP for my blood tests that were done in September. And when they did my, my full blood test, they only did one specific measure when it came to my thyroid, which is my thyroid stimulating hormone. 
and on the blood test that I received, it was the results on one side and then the healthy ranges. I'm going to put that in quotation marks, healthy ranges on the right hand side. Talking to a few people now, those healthy ranges are from apparently the 1960s and they're based on a male. <laughs> That's not necessarily keeping up with what is ideal nowadays and what is ideal for a female. So I had a look because I had requested that information to send through to Dr. Dave, I had a look at that. And my TSH was 4.49. The range stops at 4.5. So I was like right on the cusp of high. <laughs> so when your TSH is high, it can mean that you have hypothyroidism, so an underactive thyroid. So, and I had mentioned that number to a few people, one friend, like a different friend, who's also Lauren, <laughs> who had um, herself seen an integrative GP and another friend from work, and they said, no, 4.49 is high. So they were really surprised that the doctor didn't do anything about it at the time. So I ended up booking an appointment with an absolutely amazing naturopath. And my first appointment, like an integrative GP was going to be, it went for an hour. She asked all sorts of questions, so she covered things like gut health, hormone health. She knew about breast implant illness. She knew the terminology of explant. She knew that heavy metals are, uh, or no, knew that the implants are made of heavy metals, and those heavy metals can impact the body in certain ways. She was just amazing. So I'm really, really happy that I found her. And. In the first few minutes of my appointment, she looked over those blood tests and she's like, wow, your, your TSH 4.49. So naturopaths actually have a different range that they like to go by as ideal. And their maximum is 2.5. <laughs> so I am very, very high when it comes to what a naturopath would consider optimal. So at that appointment, she also recommended that I have some updated blood tests done. So this was a whole heap of stuff. So a full thyroid panel, not just my TSH and different sex hormones. And I said to her, look, I've heard a bit of talk in the BII community about this MTHFR gene, gene mutation. I'm not quite sure of how to, to talk about it properly, but I also want to swear whenever I see the MTHFR, like this looks like you should be swearing in it. Someone's just abbreviated it anyway. I asked her whether it would be possible to add that on and she's like absolutely let's like let's get that tested too so it was just a standard blood test it did cost me a bit out of pocket and I think part of that was because I was referred by a naturopath instead of a GP but I would have probably paid that same amount of money to see an integrative GP anyway so I was like you know what I'll just cop that on the chin it's fine and yeah I had an appointment with her a few weeks later and I'll run you through uh, the results that came through. So I'll um, talk about what I had been tested for, um, what the ideal range is, um, how that interacts with the body and what her suggestion is. So obviously I'm not telling anybody, like, you know, I will still go to GPs myself in the future for what I need a GP for. And I'm not, you know, taking, telling anybody to, to, to not see a GP or anything like that. But you know, if you feel like something's not right, try something different. Like, and, and I've done that and I'm really, really happy that I did. But yeah, there's just, um, there's a lot of other options out there. So just keep advocating for yourself. Okay, so the first thing that I had tested was progesterone. So the description of that is a female sex hormone needed for supporting ovulation, the growth of uterine lining, it's needed for conception, mood stability, and thyroid hormone production. So my uh, result was five. I don't quite know how to read the measure of that, but the ideal range for the specific time in my cycle would be up to 15. So that kind of result may contribute to things like PMS, shorter cycles, and, and possible like non-ovulation. So... I do have a very short cycle, it's four to five days um, now that the marina's out. And because I've only got one ovary, I'm not 100% sure how it works. But when I asked my surgeon in the past, they kind of said like, sometimes you'll ovulate and some, some months you won't. So, you know, that makes sense. So my action for that one is um, to lower my prolactin, which is the next thing she tested for, as if 
your prolactin is high, your um, progesterone can be low. So um, the things that she sort of prescribed for me are chase tree, withania, vitamin B6, and that should help with increasing my progesterone. So prolactin was the next thing she tested. That's a hormone that's normally associated with lactation. High levels in non-pregnant women can be caused by hormonal conception use, which has been me in the past. And high levels can suppress ovulation by suppressing progesterone. So my result, oh my goodness, was 622 and the ideal range is below 50. Well, there you go. So that may cause PMS symptoms, low libido, vaginal dryness and possible anovulation. So the action for that one is to lower the prolactin both directly and indirectly by um, increasing dopamine. So as I mentioned before, chase tree with a new vitamin B6. The next one was estrogen, which is a female sex hormone needed for ovarian follicle development, healthy uterine lining and mood stability. So my, I was just under the, the lowest part of the ideal range. So I, I came in at 199 and the ideal range is 200 to 1300. And the actions for that one are to support liver detoxification, which, which supports hormone balance. So that can include turmeric, B vitamins, taurine and magnesium, and optimize estrogen to progesterone ratio. So that's um, chaste tree as well. The next one that she tested was free androgen index or FAI. Testosterone is one androgen needed for hair growth, muscle building, libido and sexual desire. And I came in towards the lower end of the range, so I was 2.9%. The ideal range is 0.4 to 8%. It can possibly be contributing to thinning hair, fatigue and poor concentration. So for the action for that particular one is to support libido and hormone balance with Shadavari, zinc, and to support hair growth with zinc, iodine, and selenium. The next one is thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. So that had actually improved since my previous test. Um, that one is a hormone produced by the brain intended to stimulate the thyroid to produce hormones. Levels continue to rise when the thyroid is not producing enough hormones. So that's why when the TSH is high, it can mean hypothyroidism. So the, the lower functioning thyroid so my previous test in september was 4.49 my new test comes in at 3.54 but mind you the ideal range for a naturopath is between 1 and 2.5 so this indicates the presence of a slightly underactive thyroid and what that can be called is subclinical hypothyroidism so not to the extent where I would need to take thyroxine or like thyroid medication but there's things that I can like supplementing that I can do to um, improve that so the action here is to lower TSH directly with withania, B vitamins and ro rhodiol <laughs> a lot of things that I'm still learning about the next thing she tested was free T3 and T4. So T4 is an inactive hormone produced by the thyroid. Normally the body converts T4 to T3 for healthy thyroid function and metabolism. So I was quite high on the T4. I came in at 18.3 and the ideal range is 9 to 19. And T3 came in at 6.2 with the ideal range is 3.5 to 6.5. So normal levels, levels at present hypothyroidism is still in early stages so my action for that one is to opt optimize conversion of t4 to t3 to support the metabolism which includes supplements like iodine selenium zinc tyrosine vitamin a e and d my next one was thyroid antibodies so the presence of Thyroid antibodies can indicate autoimmune conditions as the immune system produces antibodies to attack thyroid tissue. So I came in, there's a TGII that came in at 1.3 uh, and the idea was below 4 so that was fine. And the other one was ATPO which came in at 44 and the ideal is below 35. 
So the slightly elevated ATPO may indicate future risk of Hashimoto's and the elevated ATPO impairs iodine uptake. So I thought this one was really important to include because when I have been reading up, and unfortunately it's not better known in the medical world, but it's in the Facebook groups where women are talking about their experience. It's in YouTube videos that people share their experience with breast implant illness and also having the IUD as well. They do talk about suffering from Hashimoto's and they hadn't had it before having either of those, like the IUD or the implants, but then they do get diagnosed with it. So I wanted to share that because that's bringing a bit of awareness, hopefully, to that as a condition. So just my, just testing my TSH wouldn't have come back with that information. It's really important that you get these additional things tested as well, which is why I'm sharing this information. So the action item for for that particular issue is to optimize gut nutrient absorption. So there's a few in there. So glutamine, glucosamine, zinc, and vitamins A and D. Um, optimize my iodine intake. Reduce inflammation in the gut. So there's um, glucodamine, vitamin D, zinc, and probiotics. So the next one was reverse T3. That's an inactive form of T3 that's usually produced in low levels. Too much reverse T3 has a suppressive effect on T3 levels and high levels are associated with chronic stress selenium deficiency. So I came in at 460, so that's a high normal level. The ideal is between 138 and 539. That indicates high stress and selenium deficiency and may be impairing my T3 production and producing underactive thyroid symptoms. I do hear some women talk about their cortisol levels being raised during breast implant illness and it tends to even out after they've had their implants taken out. And I guess that makes sense because your body is under physical stress and then possibly also because of these symptoms that we don't know like why they're happening, we're then also emotionally stressed as well because... You know, some people will talk about the fact that they feel like they're dying. I, my wording for that was that I felt like my body was giving up on me. So maybe the the um, mix of the physical and the emotional stress might have been causing this to happen. So my action for that one is to support stress response by supplementing magnesium, taurine, B vitamins, vitamin C, uh, rhodiola, withania, and reduce my T4 to reverse T3 conversion with selenium. Now the final one, <laughs> the one was the most interesting, which was the MTHFR gene mutations. And before I go into this one, I would love for somebody who knows a bit about the MTHFR gene to, you know, maybe jump onto the show and and share their knowledge about it because I've seen. One doctor in the US talking about doing a bit of research into whether people with this gene mutation are more likely to develop breast implant illness. So yeah, really interested in this one and it was a big eye opener for me. I've sort of encouraged my younger sister to maybe have this tested as well um, because it does inf impact a few things. So MTHFR is an enzyme that is essential to detoxification and gene methylation. Gene mutations can reduce enzyme functioning, and this increases the risk of B vitamin deficiencies, miscarriage, cardiovascular disease, and dementia. Now, I've possibly mentioned this a few times throughout the podcast, but I'll go into a bit more detail now. In um, 2020, I lost my dad to frontotemporal dementia. He was only 74. Looking back, he probably started showing signs of that in his mid 60s it was things like he was a bit more withdrawn but a lot of the stuff could have been attributed to other things so dad had some industrial deafness because he was a diesel mechanic so was around a lot of noise for a lot of his career so didn't hear much and refused to wear his hearing aids which so many people do so we just thought maybe he was being a bit more withdrawn because he wasn't engaging in the conversations because he couldn't hear them my dad was one of the sweetest people i've ever come across he only ever lost his call with me once and i was being like so bratty and sooky about 
moving my car. I was a bit scared about scratching it. Um, and I was just carrying on his, and all he did was throw his heart hands up in the air. He's like, fine, just leave it out then. And then walked off. Like that was the angriest I ever saw my dad. He did start to show some sort of verbal aggression. He had some problems with that. Dad was the kind of person who was such a specialist at his job that he worked for a few companies that actually went out of business, but he was never without work because he had a reputation around Adelaide that um, he was such a good diesel mechanic. So it was really, really great, his job. But he was starting to have some problems at work. He was starting to get a little bit funny about if somebody had parked in his car park or sat at his spot in the lunchroom, which he never was like that before. He suddenly randomly moved out to the country without really any notice. And like we would go out to visit him and the house was... <laughs> very untidy, very unclean, wasn't clean properly. And when we tried to discuss it with him, he would escalate a little bit. So it was really hard to deal with. We were like, what are we doing so wrong? But then there was this moment of, there was a bushfire not far from where he was living. And we tried to call him to let him know about it. He was just really confused and wasn't grasping what we were telling him. So being a small town, we were able to call the local police officer um, so that they could go and just do a welfare check on him and just so that they could keep an extra eye out that, that if that fire did make it closer to where he was living that um, they could get in touch with us so we could come and pick him up or you know try and organise some different accommodation for him short term. That police officer gave me a call once he had visited Dad because it was a two-hour drive away from where I live and um, yeah, had let us know that he was just very confused. He was very friendly but very confused and... That was when I started to sort of think, okay, something's not right and started to take him for tests. And the very first appointment I took him to uh, was with a GP, again, in the country. So it was a lot of driving that particular day, but I'm glad that I, I got it done because I got some answers. But yeah, basically the doctor's like, oh, you know, I could do some cognitive function testing, I guess it was, um, here but I think your dad's too far gone we should really get him off for some scans so I took dad for a CT scan that afternoon had an appointment as soon as I could with the doctor afterwards to find out and yeah basically came back that dad had some atrophy in his brain around the frontotemporal lobes um, getting a bit emotional talking about it because it was a really hard time um, but um, having that like, you know, I did a bit of research about that particular dementia. I also lost my grandpa, so my dad's dad, to a different form of dementia as well. He was having trans ischemic attacks, so um, I guess vascular dementia is what that would be considered under. So, you know, it's always in the back of my mind that that's something that I might be at risk of. Um, so hearing that, I was like, okay, what do I need to do to try and avoid that happening? Because I know that dad wouldn't have wanted to be like that towards people like he was just such an independent person and always trying to be helpful and um yeah I don't want you know I want to do what I can in my life now to try and avoid that happening down the track Whew. so basically um I came back with I don't know quite how to how to word it but two mutations so that means one of two genes is mutated in each of the two gene variants so that means that my mthfr enzyme function is impaired by at least 50 percent detoxation and methylation capacity is reduced homeocysteine is likely elevated and i'm likely deficient in folate b12 and b6 now many years ago it might have actually been around the same time that I had a GP, the GP tell me that I was obese on the BMI. He also did some blood tests and I came back as low in vitamin B12. And he asked me if I was like a vegan or a vegetarian, um, if I didn't eat a lot of red meat. I'm like, no, like I have red meat a few times a week. And so it was so low that they ended up giving me vitamin B12 injections. And I think it was like one every month for three months and I remember not long after that I was I had actually changed jobs and it was a completely different pace of job it was like this 
a response team so like um, we were the the team that people would go to if somebody was off sick and somebody needed appointments still and it was fast paced and high stress and I thought maybe that I was functioning better because I was being challenged more but my memory was really good I was super switched on it was like it was amazing like I you know it wasn't great working in a stressful situation but the way my brain function was at the time was really great and any blood tests I've had since then haven't come back deficient in vitamin B but I don't actually think the last one had tested that anyway that makes sense so that was the particular kind of B vitamins that my body does absorb so the naturopath explained it that at the moment if I'm taking any kind of B vitamins or folate I'm only absorbing 30% of that at best so yeah the injections were able to to be absorbed by my body because of the kind of B vitamins they are. Anyway, there's specific B vitamins that I can take that my body will absorb. So I have started that. And um, other things that I can do is to support homeocysteine clearance from the body to reduce long-term health risks. So that's with um, supplementing selenium, detox greens, NAC, which is, I think, I'm not going to even try acetylcysteine, I think. B6, B12 and folate. So that was the list of results that I got from my blood test. So very, very eye-opening there. So when it comes to treatment, so short-term goals for me are to support detoxification pathways. So that includes liver, bowel, lymphatics, kidneys and skin to clear any residual toxins from implants, which could be interfering with thyroid function. So going back to that MTHFR gene mutation, obviously because my body doesn't detox very well on its own, I haven't recovered that well from my explant or from the BII impacts I guess is probably the better way to word that so I'm really happy that she knew what to sort of prescribe to like what supplements to prescribe to kind of help that and the second one is to support healing of the gut lining with binding clays and specific amino acids which will aid nutrient absorption and reduce intestinal hype <laughs> uh intestinal inflammation basically and the third one of my short-term goals is to support conversion of inactive t4 to active t3 instead of the stress induced reverse t3 with specific thyroid nutrients as well as reducing cortisol which is a stress hormone my long-term goals are to continue to support my conversion of t4 into t3 instead of reverse t3 which will optimize my thyroid function my metabolism weight balance energy and hair growth as well as prevent thyroid autoimmunity development so i really really want to do what i can to try and avoid the hashimoto's number two is to support the balance of sex hormones including reducing elevated prolactin and boosting low progesterone which will improve with any pms symptoms Number three is to support the MTHFR gene mutation and re reduce homocysteine levels by supplementing with activated folate, B6 and B12, which will support the detoxification and methylation, thus being protective for future pregnancies, which is not something that is on the cards for me at all. Finally, support gradual sustainable weight loss through optimizing my thyroid function, reducing my cortisol, which impedes weight loss, um, resistance training and thermogenic lipolysis enhancing herbs and nutrients so i'm on a few supplements and uh i'll sort of go through what they contain so the first one is something that contains zeolite which is an ancient mineral that binds to heavy metals it binds to bacterial endotoxins and liver metabolizes and absorbs them via the bowel this will help to strengthen the intestinal barrier and also detox any remaining silica or chemical adjuvants from the breast implant so very very important considering that news i found out this morning about the gel bleed the next one is uh, one that includes marine greens brassicas vitamins minerals and amino acids to help support phase 2 liver detoxification pathways which is needed to break down and eliminate toxic residues and hormone metabolites so the next one the rationale here is typically in bii the toxic chemicals in the implants cause damage to the cells of the intestinal lining as they circulate in the bloodstream. So this impairs nutrient absorption and thyroid hormone production as well. So there's an amino acid powder that I take that repairs the lining of the gut and improves the nutrient absorption 
and the gut-derived immune system. The next one contains vitamin E, C and D, zinc, selenium, tyrosine and iodine, which are all needed for thyroid hormone production. Also contains withania, which is a herb that has been shown to lower elevated THS and support stress resilience. Rhodiola is another adaptogen herb to reduce fatigue. The final one, which is a specific B vitamin complex for people with the MTHFR gene mutation. So that's got a methylated or activated folate, B6 and B12, circumvent the MTHFR gene mutations and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, poor detoxification and future pregnancy loss, etc. The other B vitamins and serine help with energy production and mood balance. So I was a little bit concerned when she mentioned anything containing the word detox <laughs> because the way I saw detoxes was probably more of an unhealthy detox that people have done in the past. I remember years ago I had a friend who used to do the lemon detox all the time and it was always in the lead up to a night out so she can fit in a smaller dress like you know not a very healthy headset that's probably something that she needed to work on but that was my what I had sort of seen like where people were basically starving themselves or e eating super restrictive diets and I wasn't ready for that kind of thing so my next question to her after going through all of this was what do I need to do with my eating like do I need to sort of go on something super restrictive and she she's like no way like I don't like or believe in those kind of really restrictive things but you know there's a few things that I can do to enhance my diet and enhance my like soaking in of the nutrients I guess so my first recommendation is to aim to consume at least two serves um, a day of essential fatty acids so I don't like fish I've tried liking it I went through a stage where I reacted to it almost like a an allergic reaction so I don't eat it anymore and I know it's good for me and I've tried but I just don't I just don't like the flavor so I am adding like a handful of nuts each day um, so I actually will wake up in the morning I've stepped away from doing any kind of intermittent fasting because I'm sort of reading more and more and it doesn't look like it's overly great for women's hormones so I I don't I won't be doing that anymore so I wake up in the morning and before I exercise I'll have a handful of nuts and a big glass of water as well adding a tablespoon of chia seeds into my smoothie. I already do that. I do put some chia seeds into my morning smoothie. And then adding two teaspoons of cold pressed flaxseed oil and, and I can do that into my smoothie as well. So I have started to do that and I haven't noticed any kind of change in the flavor. It's not an expensive supplement or oil. I can just get it from my local health food shop. I work across the road from one so I just go for a walk in my break and buy it. So that's no massive change for me really there. The next one is to increase my intake of thermogenic foods. So these foods increase your metabolic output. So that includes green tea or matcha. So I used to be so like religious with drinking one green tea a day. And I really enjoyed it in my morning with like my oat bar. <laughs> it was just a little, little thing. It just felt like it's kind of indulgent and I had sort of stepped away from that because I was taking like a fat burner supplement in the morning, which I don't do anymore either. Um, and then having a mocha or as my partner calls it, a cup of lies because it's not a proper coffee. <laughs> so I, I, and like, I don't need a lot of caffeine to function. If I have caffeine too late in the day, I end up not sleeping so well. So I have started to have a green tea every day. Like I have a green tea with mint. I just buy the Aldi one and it's delicious. So that's no big deal. The next thing that she's recommended for the thermogenic foods is chili, turmeric and ginger. So I quite often cook with chili. Depending on the recipe, I'll um, add ginger as well. So I'll find some ways to add turmeric into my diet as well. And lean protein. So that can include chicken, turkey, pork or beef um, or pea or whey protein. So I do put a scoop of whey protein in my smoothie every morning. I eat a lot of chicken. Sometimes we will buy the lean beef but I probably will lean towards getting that more often than not now yeah so that's again no real huge changes like nothing scary or daunting 
The third one is to aim to increase my intake of brassica vegetables to support phase two liver detoxification. <laughs> and she had sort of given me uh, things like broccoli and cauliflower, but they're high FODMAP. I really miss broccoli. Like I wish I could eat it again, but so we had to sort of steer a different direction when it comes to that. So that can include kimchi sauerkraut, which I'm still yet to buy. I keep forgetting to get it. Bok choy, kale, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. Cabbage and Brussels sprouts tend to react with my stomach. So I'm going to try sauerkraut and see if I like it. That'll be something I grab in the next few days. My next recommendation was in, to increase my water intake. So I'm not great with tracking how much I drink, but I've probably moved away from drinking as much as I should um, lately. Just, I don't even know why it is. Like, I like water, I have no problem with it, but um, it's like when I get home from work, I just tend to forget <laughs> to drink water. So i um, aiming to drink between two and two and a half liters a day. I am very active and I do use a sauna, so I need to make sure that I am hydrating enough for that kind of stuff. So it's important, especially because I'm very active, as I just mentioned, and also for use with the infrared sauna, which I have one at home. <laughs> Water will assist in the detoxification process via the lymphatic system, um, via the kidneys, liver and skin, which we are increasing over the next month. And finally, gastrointestinal systems. Man, that just took me five goes to get that working right like bloating, gassiness, nausea, and sometimes headaches can occur during the detoxification. So if this occurs, try drinking a digestive herbal tea blend. So um, look for ingredients like fennel, peppermint, licorice, ginger, lemon balm, um, one to two times per day. So I'll just grab a peppermint tea in that kind of situation. But yeah, it's good to know um, to what, what to reach for if um, I'm not feeling great during that detoxification. So there were also some lifestyle recommendations. So before I was probably using my sauna at home once to twice a week. If you would like me to increase that to three to four times a week, especially during this first month where I am doing the detoxification. And she also would like me to do the following while I'm in the sauna, which I never thought to do. Dry body brushing. So I was doing that every now and then, and it was generally when I had time in the morning after I've done a workout before I jumped in the shower. But it's getting to winter, the bathroom in my house is right at the back of the house, so it's super cold and I just, I, as soon as I sort of got out of my workout clothes, I just wanted to jump into the warm shower, so I wasn't body brushing as much as I should, but doing it at the start of a sauna before I get too sweaty, but it's also nice and warm in there, is just such a good idea. So I actually have my dry body brush just sitting there in the sauna, so when I jump in, I'm going to start doing my body brushing straight away. And also 10 minutes of guided meditation. That's to reduce my cortisol levels, which is possibly impacting on my thyroid function, my weight loss. So right at the end of the sauna, I sort of time it. Um, there's a little timing, a little like keypad um, on the inside of the sauna, which tells me how long I've got left. So once I'm approaching the 10 minute mark, I'll just do a 10 minute guided meditation that I find on YouTube. There's a few different ones that I've tried. And I've also recently downloaded the Insight Timer app just to give that a go. So yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying that. I, I, my, my brain is so busy and my, my job at work is so busy. I'm always trying to do things at home that it's hard for me to slow down. So that's kind of a moment for me to like to force me to slow down and it, it does feel really good. The next recommendation is to aim to get five to 10 minutes of morning and evening sunlight exposure to the retinas. So that can include going for a walk or sitting and eating outside. So this resets the circadian rhythm. So my internal body clock to regulate the release of cortisol and melatonin, which are normally impaired when we sit inside all day with artificial lights and use screens excessively in the evening. So this can improve my energy, stress, metabolic health and sleep quality. So I tend to try and do a walk because I do have a desk job. I do have a sit-stand desk when I'm at work and at home. But when I have like a morning tea break and gener generally my lunch break, I'll go for like a five to ten minute walk around the block. If the weather doesn't allow it, what I might start to do is just sit outside under cover just to get that sunlight in, just to sort of reset my circadian rhythm. The final one 
is to try not to do too many high intensity workouts per week. So that can actually spike cortisol levels. And I had been reading about that a bit before this appointment. So it was really interesting that she included it in, in my recommendations. So the, the spike in cortisol can actually suppress our metabolism and then possibly cause it to be difficult to lose weight. So instead, do a mix of resistance training, so maybe two times per week, high intensity cardio, maximum two times per week, and then yoga or stretching, so minimum at least like once a week. And then I can do, you know, walking up to like three or four times. So that that's all really manageable. You know, I was with my timing, I was only really doing one weight session a week and it was either lower body or upper body. My like my favorite's probably I'm really strong through my lower body, but I prefer to train upper body for some reason, just because lower body hurts. So what I started to do, I swapped. We were doing three spin classes throughout the week. I've just swapped one of those out for weight. So I'll do two spin classes. One of them's a super high intensity sprint, like Les Mill sprint. And the other one's a half an hour RPM class. And then I have a break on Thursday mornings. That's my sort of sleep in morning. Yeah, and then weekends we'll do walks or hikes or low intensity bike rides. But another recommendation that she suggested to tack on to this is to train around my cycle. And again, this is something that I've been seeing a lot of lately. I had purchased the the Move With Us program for the year and uh, Rachel Dillon, who is the founder, I guess, of, of Move With Us, she has a podcast and she'd recorded an episode on training around her cycle. So yeah, really interested in that. So the recommendation is in the follicular phase. So that's between day five and 13. That's when you generally have the most energy due to the peaks in estrogen, the peak in luteinizing hormone, I think it is. It's the sort of LH here, follicular stimulating hormone, FSH. So that at that time of the month, they sort of say embrace high intensity interval training and heavy weights. The next stage is your early luteal phase, so between day 14 and 21. So your hormones are picking up and you're likely to have more energy here. So again, embrace high intensity interval training and heavy weights. The next phase is the late luteal phase, so between day 21 and 28. Estrogen and progesterone are declining, so you're more likely to be fatigued. So embrace restorative exercise like Pilates, yoga, walking, low intensity cardio and lower weights. And then the final phase is your period, so between day one and five, that's the time to do the most restorative workouts, so things like yoga, light cardio and low weights. So I'm going to start factoring that in um, just to see how I feel. I definitely notice differences in a difference in energy levels throughout my cycle and I sort of started to notice after the marina coming out, like I talked about my first cycle being one where I <laughs> was overly emotional and each month I have noticed the emotional symptoms getting better. Like this last one, I wouldn't have even known based on my moods that it was coming. Like I, I didn't really notice much. I probably got a little bit ragey at coat hangers getting stuck on each other, but that's standard living for me. <laughs> but the physical symptoms for me are getting worse. So the... Stomach aches can be quite bad. The bloating can be quite bad. My back can get a bit sore. So training around my cycle and embracing the lower intensity stuff closer to my period is probably a good way to go anyway. Super excited to give that a whirl. So after all of that, I guess the takeaway from all of that is if you're not feeling 100%, keep finding other ways. <laughs> and... Yeah, just don't stop looking for answers because I feel like a lot of us spend so many years feeling like crap and I guess we get used to that way of living and any kind of little improvement seems huge. But then when the, like the big sign for me was when things started to get bad again that I needed to, yeah, really look into what was causing it because it wasn't a way that I wanted to feel long term. So I'm really, really glad that I've had conversations with so many people about it. You know, I, I can be a bit of an oversharer, that's why I've got this podcast. But, you know, that's obviously led to to me finding this avenue and, and I'm, you know, on the mend. So I will be recording a separate episode, which 
we'll sort of talk about my experience throughout the the detox phase. I might, depending on how long or short that update is, tied in with my other phases of my treatment plan with my naturopath, but super thankful that I found her and yeah, really looking forward to the next few months and, and how I'm going to feel throughout all of that because I feel like I'm going to see improvements. I just have a really good feeling about this. And yeah, so yeah, if any of this kind of resonated with you or if you know, you've gone through similar and you've got any recommendations, feel free to reach out to me. You know, I'd love to share them on my podcast, on my social media for the podcast as well, just to help other people. And also, you know, we're still sharing the stories of other women. So if you've explanted and you're wanting to share your story, reach out to me on the Instagram or the Facebook and we can organize a time for us to sit down and have a chat together so that you can share your story as well. Thank you so much for sticking with me. You know, I thought this was going to be a quick episode, but it ended up being a big one. And also at the time of recording this, the podcast has just hit 4,000 listens in 33 countries. So thank you to everybody that's taken time out of their days to listen to my story and the story of others as well. Yeah, really honoured to to have reached that. I thought I might get, you know, one or 200 listeners and that it'll be friends and family listening to the episodes but you know there's a lot of you out there and I appreciate all of you take care of yourselves and I will speak to you all soon this podcast shares my own experience and research I'm not a medical or health professional you can find me on instagram at could it be ii podcast Thank you to my incredibly talented partner, Jacob Tengdahl, for the intro and outro music. All recording, editing and artwork is done by me. Thank you for listening.